This morning at six o'clock, it was quite a cold morning and um, I checked the temperature was nine degrees. Now, okay, it's a little later in the day. It's, as you see, quarter past, just gone quarter past 11. But the temperature is nearly 20. It's about 19 degrees and I put that down to purely the sun on the side of the boat, heating the steel up and and radiates through the through the walls and uh, yeah, I quite like it so dark colors does do good for the warmth of the boat inside it's free heating now it could be argued that the heat goes out and um, I think that's a good argument but also I've had this boat like yesterday for example it rained so I put the fire on there and um, now I've learned how to use damn thing. It went up to 26. Ooh, it was a bit warm. Um, but it was nice. And uh, I only had one load of coal on and one, well, wood to get it going, one load of coal on to get it going. And then when that fire ran out, which was about, well, I don't know, I put it on about half past three, went off the flames, left it about six. And it was 26 degrees and I let it die out. So one load of coal, one load of wood, one load of heat, job done. And uh, I know, you know, I am, I am mindful that winter time will come and it's going to get cold on this boat. But I'm learning how to heat it up efficiently. And I think that's the thing. Efficient heating. Sun during the day when the sun's out. Maximise solar anyway welcome to sandbag sunday it's the first time i've used i've used the teapot oh, i don't know why i've not used it before I've I've forgotten about it to be honest and uh, this is going to be a tea type of vlog so if you haven't got a cup of tea and uh, some toast because it's Sunday morning and wherever you're watching this I've got the computer in front of me which, which sometimes does makes funny noises when emails come in and things so uh, I'd like to discuss something um, which is close to my heart actually because this is a new boat. Wanting to broach this subject I appreciate some may find confrontational and emotive but it's something that I think needs to be discussed and that's collision avoidance. With so many people choosing to live on the waterways and um, cruise up about you know uh, cruise around the cut as, as far as you know enjoyment and leisure is concerned I appreciate we ought to have an obligation uh, for safety of both ourselves and others and um, how many of us know the obligations and how many of us know what our responsibilities are I mean there's something called etiquette I want to go on to etiquette but my iPad's over there and I need to go and get it at some stage I will, I'll get that in a bit and I think, uh, having watched the, the the tube, there's been a number of people that have documented um, accidents or collisions or bumps or scrapes that they've had. And I thought to myself, hmm, is that normal? Is that right? We certainly wouldn't do it in a car, would we? You know, it's, you have a duty to to um, tell someone if you've had a bump and if you've bumped someone you have a duty to stop because there's law and there's enforcement of law um, but on the canals it doesn't appear that that's the case and so many people just accept accept the the bumps and the collisions as part of canal life but is that the right attitude ignorance of the rules and even self-denial is not a good place for us to be in um, and I would like us to be more aware of our surroundings and our responsibilities 
Um, and me, for one, um, cards on the table, as as they say, I've changed my attitude um, since having done this research and since watching the these tubers tube the uh, their little their mishaps or bumps or, or collisions or whatever you want to call it. Um, I've changed my attitude because this is my home and I'm sure it is many of your homes too if not you're going to home on a boat and I want to look after it and I don't want my boat to be smashed bumped into because it, whilst it may not damage the boat there's stuff on the inside for example if you've got a television and it's propped on a corner and you know a corner stand as, as I know some people have and uh, you have a bump and the telly falls over. Okay, who pays? I, I don't know. If you know, comment below. But And I'm sure insurance companies will sort it out. But what if that bump was, was a little bit worse than just a bump? Oh, and what if that didn't manufacture until later on in life? If you don't report that as an accident. I, and these are the things I don't know. But this vlog is about collision avoidance and trying to stop the bumps, the collisions that have happened. I think that, that kind of does as an intro. And I was given a young lady, well, she's a bit older than me, she's retired, not that young. Um, but I, I was helping her through the locks um, on Monday when I moved up here, um, which is north of Cassio Park and every time i went in the lock first set the lock and then she came in afterwards every time she bumped my boat now i think there's bumps accepted in in locks and stuff like that i mean it wasn't she wasn't going fast it was a little bit of a kiss really but it was a bump that is par for the course if you like but the ones i'm on about is is the you've met each other head on on the canals or someone's bumped into the side of you or, or whatever it is that's happened is those sort of collisions I wonder oh, was that really necessary I don't know I'm not there I'm not going to criticize I'm not going to point the finger but I'm just now more aware of some of the rules now in Australia you can't you can't pick up a boat unless you've done a driving test a helmsman's course test and a theory test of any description because there's responsibilities legal and otherwise in Australia and yet we seem to um, hire boaters for example can get absolutely smashed and, and steer a boat and then what happens if they bump into another <laughs> no mate no I, I don't know what I'd do if that happened um, particularly if you get drunk people on the boat because being drunk in charge of a vehicle you're not allowed to do that in a car but you can do it on a boat maybe etiquette tells you not to but is etiquette I'll discuss etiquette in greater detail but is etiquette enforceable the answer is no we'll discuss that in a bit um, but that was interesting um, fact finding what I've learnt through the tube um, through other people vlogging is narrow boat to narrow boat there doesn't appear to be an awful lot of damage which is good but what about narrow boat to GRP cruiser you know those glass reinforced plastic yogurt pots people call them um, what if a narrow boat hits them you know I think you know my 20 tons of steel here going at whatever speed hits a GRP at the wrong place maybe in the center of the boat and creates a crack Ooh, that may not do it any good it may end up sinking so I, I guess my insurance will pay up but if that's through negligence should there be should there be something that happens and who enforces those rules and which rules do they enforce and um, you know serious injury I, I, I was trying to think now on um, I'm trying to think there is on the waterways 
part of the website I looked at it does say along the lines of if you cause injury or serious damage you will probably end up in court and that could be a serious um, costly event so one would argue for the waterways website to say something like that that there is there has been occasions where this has happened uh, you know i don't know the vloggers haven't vlogged i am um, a vlogger but i haven't seen any of that um so i can't comment but i wonder i just i just don't know again if you know comment below please but who's the rules so what are the rules of the waterways and um, do they apply to inland waterways what are our obligations and where do we stand legally if something untoward was to happen and uh, as I said earlier I felt I don't know enough and I I commented on one of my earlier vlogs I'm going to look at this and someone said, oh, you might open a can of worms. You might open Pandora's box. Well, yeah, because I think it's the right thing to do. And uh, I, like I said, I've changed my the way that I helm, steer, tiller, because of it. Because I'm now more aware. And I think, um, because I'm more aware, I take my time a bit more I think that's that's safe to say um, many people talk about canal etiquette uh, so before we go on any further I just want to discuss the word etiquette it's a noun don't know I haven't got a clue I can remember <laughs> this true story I can remember we had um, Pashtu, I think it was. We had Pashtu lessons. We were going out to Afghanistan. We had some some Afghani guy come in and teach us basic Pashtu. And he was describing a sentence, and he was saying a sentence is made up of nouns, adjectives, verbs, pronouns, and and, and some some other words. And I can remember looking at Pete, and I can remember Pete looking at me. I said, "What? What's he on about?" And even the Scottish commander says, he said, um, the blokes at the back haven't got a clue what you're on about. None, not many of us. Well, we went to school, but probably didn't take any notice. So, noun. Dunno. Anyway. The customary code of polite behaviour in society or among members of a particular professional group. It's a code. Can you enforce a code? No, is the answer. Um, so nothing in the, uh, the, I mean, there's another two or three um, little points of what of what etiquette means, but pretty much that that noun, that earlier comment is, is kind of what it means. All, all three of them mean the same thing really. Um, but at no point does it mention law and etiquette um, I do not believe can be legally challenged. I don't know. If you're a lawyer out there, let me know. Comment below. On my research for this topic, I looked at British Waterways and Canal Trust, and um, both are, are charitable organisations, and the waterways um, state that their trust is aimed at improving enjoyment on the canals and they appear not to be an authority on the rules of the road and the canal and river trust state on their last page in the boaters handbook of 2021 we are the charity that cares for and brings to life 2,000 miles of canals and rivers across england and wales so they're not a safety authority either or it doesn't appear to be so so i ended up in my research looking at the rya Royal Yacht Association um, who appear to be the authority of the regulations of operating floating vessels and I discovered that the RYA promote the international 
regulation for collision avoidance or colregs as the legal obligation for all boaters all the RYA falls under the remit of International Maritime Organization which is a UN specialized agency responsible for shipping now I'm going to discuss some of these rules because I've extracted the ones that deal with big boats and what I mean by big boats those that could go on the ocean because if you are an ocean going boat well there's all sorts of extra rules you need to be aware of but we're just little boats floating around on the inland waterways so I've extracted some of those some of those rules rule number one I'm going to put it up on the screen have a read while I make myself a cup of tea Um, rule five, look out. Uh, it's on the screen. So when approaching a blind bend, someone should be on the bow to provide minimum warning of an approaching vessel. But the rule five does state, I'm reading from my notes here, every vessel should at all times maintain a proper lookout by sight and hearing. Now I've seen various um, boaters with headphones on. So um, if you were to have an accident, because if you've got a beep, beep, and you've got your headphones on, you're not gonna hear it. And then if you have an accident, oh, well, why didn't, I didn't see you. Well, you had your headphones on and I gave a beep and you didn't listen. I've been guilty, not of headphones, but having music on the top. Um, and it's, again, it's one of those things, oh, it's a contributing factor if something was to go wrong and you had your headphones on. Also, <clears throat> a proper lookout by sight. Now, if you're a single boater, you can't have a, a, another lookout because that's you. But it means you do, you do have to pay attention. And maybe if you're on the bottle, you're not paying attention because your mind's on other things. I, 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 again, it's one of those things that um, is, a, is a contributing factor. Um, but then we move on to um, rule number six, which is safe speed on your screen. The ability to stop within distance of a collision. So almost as if you think you're doing the right speed right up until the time you, you make a bump or you have a collision, in which case it could be argued you were going too fast because you wasn't safe speed for the conditions of the waterways or what was going on in front of you. Um, so that's a really difficult thing to navigate, yeah, I think is, is a good word. Um, so safe speed also on tick over now there's there's people I've, I've noticed it's not just one or two I think a lot of people don't understand the rules of tick over now you can be traveling let's say at four mile an hour and then you approach your boat moored up and you go to tick over but well, the boat's still going at four mile an hour and you know, oh, I'm on tick over, mate. Well, yeah, you might be on tick over as far as the engine and propellers concerned, but the boat is still moving, and it takes a long time for that boat to to slow down to tick over speed. And I learned this on my helmsman's course. You've got to be at tick over speed at the time that you approach the boat. Now that is a bit of a pain, and I appreciate how much of a pain that is because. The, uh, particularly down London Way, you know, I'm at Watford Way at the moment, just north of Watford, and there's boats up the yin yang. You can only go tick over, well, 90%, 80% of the time, simply because there's boats all over the place, and that's a pain. I get it. But 
safe speed and all that sort of stuff so let's take an example then i know it's taken some time to get to examples but i think is is the homework that i've had to go through before i've actually got to examples and you know i'll waffle on a bit and there's a boat going that way and there's a boat coming this way and there's a moored boat on the side okay and there's a slight bend playing by the rules of rule number five lookout i am observing my arcs looking about me and i see a slight bend and i see an obstruction on the left and i say to my passenger go, I'll go up the front and, and have a look see if there's any coming around the corner will you right thing to do it doesn't always happen because life isn't in the real world you know all those rules aren't always in the real world and, and you just don't do it half the time anyway so you're traveling this way and you've got a slight bend come in the other way single-handed boater you're thinking nothing coming all i'm gonna do is give it some give it some distance between um the moored boat and me and then i'll go to tick over just as i'm passing it well you're still going four mile an hour for example aren't you for example meanwhile the two boats see each other a little bit late and let's say for example the boat that going this way let's say it's me for example i decide well it's my water because he's got an obstruction on the left on his right there's an obstruction on the left that's his obstruction he's got to give ground arguably yes but he didn't see it that way he continues going which then because of safe speed because of no lookout the boats collide now you could argue well there's nothing i could do or anything like that well actually perhaps if we thought about it slightly differently and you say well there's a boat coming maybe a bit erratic maybe he's in the wrong but if i slow down then i am doing everything i possibly can to avoid an accident it's like being on the roads isn't it i'll tell you you're going you're going 60 mile an hour down a down a, an a road there's a fella coming the opposite way got on a parked car he's doing 60 mile an hour what are you going to do he pulls out to overtake thinking there's sufficient room and ordinarily there is what do you do continue going at 60 miles an hour or are you going to slow down and um, miss the obstruction and miss the oncoming traffic otherwise you'll have a bit of a crash won't you and it won't be any good so i don't understand why um we don't often apply these same rules on the waterways as you do on a road i just don't get it so in the example we had um rule number eight avoiding the collision so if necessary um stop your vessel regardless of who is in the right or the wrong okay it kind of makes sense to me really to be honest 17 rule number 17 on your screens So regardless of what the other vessel does, right or wrong, you are bound to take appropriate action to avoid the collision. This includes stopping in the water, not going to tick over, where the vessel continues to move through the water. Yeah, so um, in the earlier example, if, um, if for example, you know, boat coming this way, I'm going this way, and I think, okay, I'll slow down. I'll go to tick over, but bear in mind you've been going slightly faster than tick over perhaps um it's not slowing the boat down I, I would rather avoid the accident 
full stop. These, I must, uh, you know, reiterate, these are rules from, from coal regs, sponsored by the RYA, sponsored by, let's have another look up there, sponsored by um, the International Maritime Organization, <clears throat> which is responsible for all shipping. Um, so I'm not having a pop at anyone. I've got the benefit of hindsight and I've learnt from watching those YouTube mistakes, collisions, or whatever it is that people have done. And I'm mindful of it, and I'm, you know, I, I'm just making this vlog because I, I want to pass on what I've learnt because I've never seen this on the tube. And um, I think it's important that we understand our obligations and rules and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, rules on overtaking. Rule, rule 13 is overtaking. Quite a short rule, but it's an important one. So it's the responsibility of the overtaking vessel to at no stage impede the vessel it is overtaking. But we're going to talk about that on another example because this is where it all merges into lots of little areas of greyness okay um again this come from a vlogger but i'm not going to determine which vlogger it is you might know i don't know a rather an unfortunate chain of events as well so now we're both going straight on behind is a grp grp wants to overtake sees a little bit of ground and starts giving it large narrow boat decides to back off and in their terms go three or four mile an hour now the passing grp is their responsibility to give the narrow boat width give it ground water if you like space and pass it giving it space for the narrow boat to continue on its course okay everything to this point went well except as the grp passed the bow of the narrow boat for some reason or other it stopped now it didn't matter that the narrow boat went into reverse it did collide with the GRP and it pushed it sideways and all that sort of stuff and the GRP must have been in a bit of a shock and I think the narrow boaters must have been in a bit of a shock because I would have been to be honest so there was also a boat coming this way on the opposite direction which is why the GRP had to cut in quite quick. What no one knew was going to happen was the GRP's engine cut out as it passed the bow of the narrow boat going forward. Um, which is why the narrow boat collided. So, lookout didn't need to happen. Safe speed? Well, let's discuss that if the it could be argued that had the narrow boat gone to tick over earlier given the grp more room more time to you know quickly get by at tick over speed it may have given it greater opportunity when given it full reverse to slow the boat down I don't know, wasn't there, I'm just surmising. It could perhaps be the case. But it does say, essentially, if you if you investigate the rules of safe speed, if you hit a another boat, another vessel, <clears throat> then you weren't going at safe speed. Now, the rules of overtaking were applied to a certain point 
but as the GLP passes the bow of the narrow boat, engine cuts out, therefore part of rule 13 overtaking wasn't applied because it didn't give the narrow boat space go in a forward motion. So the kicker here is no one knew that the GRP was going to um, cut out. It could be argued, and I think I'm siding with the narrow boat, is that the GRP should have overtaken with that with oncoming traffic heading their way. Well, I mean that that you know why, why do that? And um, therefore the lookout procedure for the GRP wasn't really applied. Well, he took a risk. He took a greater risk, which was unnecessary. And you know. And let's say, for example, the narrow boat hit the GRP and cracked it and sunk it. Oh, imagine that. I don't know what would have happened after that because, um, and this is where I feel sorry for the narrow boaters. They did everything they possibly could, but it could be argued in court, you're going too fast because you hit the vehicle in front. Ooh, that's a bit difficult, isn't it? And none of this would have happened if the GRP hadn't overtaken. So I feel that there's lots of grey areas in all these little scenarios and um, I don't know. I, I just think there are times it's very difficult to understand what is right and what is wrong. But safe speed applied maybe if anyone's overtaken I've, and someone's overtaken me a, a GRP as it happens uh, overtook me and um, it was a little GRP um, so I just give it room I just slow down and let him pass it's just easy in it I, I, I don't know why I did that I just did I know I remember doing it because I caught him up at the next lock I think they wanted to go through the lock before I did I think it was a bit of a rush yeah whatever that's fine that's fine. The CRT writes, the causes of collisions are a lack of boat handling skill or experience, okay. Taking your eye off the waterways, that's like lookout, and cruising too fast, rule six. It also states when overtaking, the skipper should slow down and both skippers should go as slowly as possible to avoid being drawn together, which is Balloonie's principle. It also points out um, of places to moor up and blind bends is not one of them, nor near, his bri nor near bridges or lock landings. And I see that on a regular basis, to be honest. Um, and when I read all the CRT rules, all basically common sense, <coughs> but it's those those rules which are maritime rules and they do apply to the waterways but i don't know who applies them how they're applied or what happens if you know the answer to that please comment below so we can all learn and i'm going to phone up my insurance company and give them a scenario perhaps one of these and ask so if I was driving too fast, what happens other than I'm culpable? Is there a maritime lawyer? Is there a maritime investigator? What happens? Um, you know, because all this could be an escalation of um, cost of next year's insurance, for example, because I'm a greater risk. Um, I'm going to end this vlog here simply because I don't want to go on. Um, ignorance and self-denial is not constructive to our community and to say well that will never happen to me or I, I just want I just want people to view this vlog as something that is of benefit to all and just to, to reflect I mean there's 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 three choices isn't there you can listen to this and choose to reflect and change as i've done change change the way i boat you can choose 
you can watch and choose not to change that's a choice or you can disregard it and think I'm a complete idiot and then nothing changes and nothing gets better I'm not an expert but I've spent time researching and as I've, I think I've said this I've sent my homework to someone who knows a little bit more about maritime law than I do so I've sought guidance on all this sort of stuff um, if you want to comment please do you know I'll be interested to read what your comments are and um, thanks for watching thanks for liking thanks for subscribing um, don't think there'll be a sandbag Sunday next week there will be a uh, feed me Friday and that's going to be my most favorite meal my favoritest meal it's, it's like a plate licking exercise afterwards because it's so nice well, at least I think it is. Um, so, until next time, I see you on Sunday. Ciao.